Welcome to Cheap Controls. We make videos on things that we struggled with, hoping to help you so you don't. Consider subscribing and hitting that bell. We are adding content to CheapControls.com so you can download some extra documents used in this video. I had a question from a subscriber that asked about changing the color on a progress bar based on percentage values as the progress bar increased. I'm going to run it in debug mode first so that you can see what it does. So this slider down here represents the input from a low to a high value. It could be temperature, it could be pressure, it could be about anything. And the limits here are 30 and 70. I just picked those numbers arbitrarily. And when you start up the display, it just starts right in the middle. And you can see as the input goes up, it increases. This shows, this right here shows the current percentage of the progress bar that's filled. So right now it's 65% full and it's yellow, so it's in a warning state. And then when it hits a certain level, it turns red. And when it goes down to a certain level, it turns green. What I've done is I've made it so you can adjust the limits and you can adjust the percentages to where the colors change. I'm going to go over the limits first. What I have is I have a high limit and a low value limit. If we want to go back, we can go back to the screen here. And this button here toggles between adjusting the low and the high value. So with the low value set, we can go down, we can go up. Here, if you want to make a change quicker to the low value, we can count up. And you can see it just starts to count, and I can speed it up. And I can count down. I've left a couple of things broken just to show you some things. If I go up, and as we approach 70, the low value should never go above the high value. So you always, when you build your displays or when you build your logic, you have to make it so that it checks for that. I have it checking for that over here when you single up and you'll see it changes to uh, 69. So it stays below that and every time I hit it can never go above that. If I go to my high end value, this could never go below the low value. So it can't. Now I do have it set to where it will over here. Like I said, just as an example, but the second you click here, it adjusts. But for now, we'll go ahead and adjust these values to something just random, just for testing. Yeah, that's a pretty good range there. So now when we go back, you'll see that the values have changed. So now our low value is 47, our high value is 225. I have it when you go back to this page, it sets it right in the middle. Now I don't have it check the colors right now, but you'll see they'll adjust when I start the slider. The percentages are still the same. At looks like at 30 I have it changed to yellow, and at 70 I have it changed to red. I can change the percentage on the third page. And this is what I have to change. So I have sliders, and I have the yellow set at 30 and the red set at 70. I don't need to worry about the green because that's just whatever else. So I, I can adjust the yellow to be... I set these buttons to increment and decrement one at a time for fine tuning. But you'd never have to go over 100 or under 0, so the sliders work fine. I don't have to worry about counting up quickly or slowly for this. And you can also see I have it set so you can't go above the red. So the yellow could never be a value above the red value. And the red value could never go below. But if I turn the red up, I could turn the yellow up. I could set the yellow at 80 and the red at 90, and that would be fine. But for this example, I'm going to move it down so we can tell what we're doing. I'll set it at 50 and 75. And then once again, this is set not to where it was, but this is set to mid-range. And the second I make the change, at 50 we have it go to yellow, and then at 75 it goes to red. Now I'll show you how it all works. On the front page, I have six different variables down here. 
instead of it being VA0, VA1, VA2, VA3, VA4, and VA5, I have, I've changed the name to min, max, yellow, and red because I'm making these global variables and I want to be able to identify them on the other pages just off my memory and it was easier to go min, max, yellow, and red. VA0 and 1 are local variables so I just left those VA0 and 1. I use those for some logic down the road. But you can see you can change the object name to whatever you want and then you can refer to them. You do have to be careful though, you don't want to name it something else that's on your page. This is the progress bar and there's no logic tied to it. It's all controlled by the slider. And then up here I just have numbers and I just write to those numbers as needed. And then these are just page changing buttons, that's all they are. All of the logic here happens on the touch move. And I also have some information on the page post installation. In a previous video, I talked about the difference between post installation and pre initialization. It appears that I, I may be wrong on what I had said in the previous video, and I'm digging in a little bit more, but it also appears there's not much difference between those two. And Nexion was not very forthcoming in the, when I requested information from them. So I've been using the post installation. That means everything has been loaded on the page and it's ready to go before I do stuff. What I initially do is I set this value up here equal to the min value of this variable. And I set this n1 equal to the max variable. I don't use these. It's just to display so that people can see what's going on. Then I also set the min value of the slider so that they match. So this slider max and min matches this value up here and this value up here. The progress bar always stays 0 to 100 because it's dealing in percentage, not the values, whereas this is the values and these two numbers are the values. So then I have to set up my mid. I want to assign this value right here and the position on the slider. So I use this empty variable VA and what I do is I take the difference between the maximum and minimum values that were set up in these limits. And then I divide that by 2 so that gives me the halfway point but then if this starts at 30 and goes to 60 well the difference is 30. Well 30 is not the midway point it's 45 because 30 and 60 halfway would be 45. So I subtract those two, divide it by 2, I get my 15, and then I add it to the lower value, and that's the value I put here, and that's the position on here. So it sets it right in the middle. So all I'm doing is finding the middle point of this slider. And then I also post it up here so there's a visual representation of it. And I do that here and here. And that's on the post initialization. So when it first starts up, it takes the default values and creates it. And when I leave the page and come back to the page, it resets it back up to the middle values. Now, if you had an actual sensor here, you could read those values and you wouldn't have to do some of this. But I don't have a sensor, so I wanted to come up with some sort of starting point. The other logic happens when we do a move on this. It's not during the press. I don't do anything when I press it. And I don't do anything when I release it. It's only during the move. That way you see stuff happen as you're sliding it. While it's moving, we set this value equal to this value. Because as you move it, the value is generated by the next display. And I want to make it visually apparent to the user. So I just have it copied up to there. So now I have to work on calculating the percentage value to display in this progress bar here. And what I have to do is I have to get the value of this of the total span just like we did to calculate the center point here. We have to do that every time we refresh. I could put an average or a total and keep another variable down here, but calculating it isn't that hard. So I have this variable here and I take the minimum value and subtract it from the maximum value and that gives me my total range. Then I have to find wherever we've moved this to, we write it up to this N2. So I subtract 
the minimum value from N2 and that gives me the value to where it's currently at. Because Nexion doesn't support floating points, it doesn't have decimal points, I have to take this value and multiply it by 100. So that way when I do my division, I'll get my percentage. So I take this value, wherever N2 is sitting, subtract it from the minimum, multiply it times 100, and then divide it by the total value, and that gives me my percentage. And then I store that value in N3. And you can see it's happening here. I get my maximum right here, or the range. I get the value of N2 and subtract it from the minimum. I multiply it times 100. And then I store in N3 the value of 1 divided by the value of 0, which is the percentage. Then I have to set J0, which is my progress bar, equal to that value. So that way this number here in N3 is the same as the progress bar. And then based upon the value of the progress bar, if it's greater than red, I make it red. If it's greater than yellow, I make it yellow. And the reason this works is if it sees that it's red, it doesn't go down any further. It just sets it. So if it's less than red, it'll go down here. If it's less than yellow, it will go down to the green down here. And that's how this portion works. Now we'll go look at the limits, how I set the limits. On the limits page, this button just takes me back to page one. These are just text labels to let you know you're, that this is the high value and this is the low value. There's no logic on these either. These are just um, visual representations for the user because it's also stored in the global variable on the first page. And in order to say button room, I have this two position button that I can toggle between whether I'm working on the lower value or the high value. I have the single up, which raises the value by one, and a single down, which lowers the value by one. And in these, the logic is about the same for both. And if B2, if button two is set to one, which would be the high value, then I'm gonna increment one. And you can do it two ways. You can you can do the code like this. You can say n1.val equal n1.val plus 1. Or you can shorthand it where you do, in this case, else, which means it's not on button 1, n0.val plus equals 1. These are the same statement. Since I'm incrementing it, and I never want my low value to go above my high value, I have to be careful down here so I check. So after I increment the low value, I say if the low value is greater than or equal than the high value, I make it equal to the high value minus one. And the reason I do it this way is in case that that high value or the low value goes more than one or two or three goes well above it, like in the instance where I didn't put anything on the count up, it'll correct it back down to whatever that value is, it will move it to the high value minus one. On the single down button, I do the same thing, but I'm doing the opposite. The high value, which is N1, if it's less than the low value, then I want to set it to the low value plus 1. And the low value, I don't have to worry about it. I can just keep subtracting. Now for the continuous count up and count down, there's no logic on these. What I use is I use the timer for this, and I use this slider over here. There's no logic on the slider either. But I have the slider set up for values that the timer can use. So the max value that I want to use is one second or a thousand milliseconds. That's uh, the slowest that I want the timer to count. The fastest I want is 50 milliseconds. And when I initially go to the page, I set it to 500 to half a second, and then you can adjust from there. So I go to the timer. So the first thing I do is I check to see if button number two is set to be controlling the low value or the high value. If it's set to count the low value, then I know that I'm gonna be working with N0. 
if button 1 is pressed, it's going to execute it, and then it's going to leave the loop. So if both buttons are pressed, it's going to count up. I should put something in to check for that, but at this point I don't. I just know that if it's counting up, unclick the button. And then if button 2 is pressed, then I'm going to subtract. And I don't do any logic to make sure I'm above or below. If you remember, I left that out on purpose to show you that I can go above it and that the single down catches it and resets it so, I'm, so the high value is always above the low value. And then I don't check to see if, if the B2 button is set again. I know that if it's not on the low, it must be the high. So then I check to see if button 0, BT0, is on. If it's on, then I increment it and I leave. If it's not on, then I look to see if the decrement button 1 is on and then I decrement it. And this loop runs as fast as I have this slider set. So I misspoke earlier when I said there's no logic tied to the slider. If we go to the slider, on the release, I have it set. I probably should have this set on the move so you could see the speed up and down as you slide the slider, but I have it on the release. What I do is I set the timer timing variable equal to the value of the slider. If I go back to the timer, you can see that there's a timing variable that I have default set it at half a second. Now we'll move on to the percentages. The percentages also work on sliders. I have a slider for the yellow and a slider for the red, and then I have buttons to fine tune just in case you find it hard to hit exactly 80 or something like that. And what I have on these is on the move, as we're sliding the slider, we're continually testing to see if H1 is greater than H0. And if H1, the yellow, is greater than the red, we want to make it so that it's one less than the red. And then as we're doing that, we also want to assign it to this spot right here. The same thing for the red one down here. Only on this one we do the opposite. As we slide it, we check it to see its value compared to the yellow one. And if it's less than it, then we want to set it to one greater than whatever that value is. And then we also assign it to this value so we have a visual representation down here. And then this back button takes us back. But we have to get these values, which I didn't show you in the last page, so I'll go back. We have to get these values over into the yellow and red global variables. And we do that when we hit the back button. When we press the back button, we set the global values of, of the red and yellow on page 0 equal to N0 and N1, which represent N0 as red and N1 as yellow. And then we change the page. You have to be very cautious on your order of things. If you change the page first, this would never happen because they would be erased. The minute you change the page, the local variables on this page are erased. I'm going to go back to page 1 and show you we do the same thing on this one. We take the high value and the low value, the maximum and the minimum, and we assign the global variables on page 0. And that's how it works. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments down there or head on over to Cheap Controls and fill out the form there. You can leave a question there. We don't store anything or use any of the information for anything. Also, the HMI file will be available at Cheap Controls also within a day or two of this video being posted. Well, that's about it for this video. If you like what you saw, consider giving me a thumbs up and also consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching.